Hey guys, Pastor Jurgen here. I'm so glad you're tuning into one of our powerful messages that is guaranteed to absolutely elevate your life to another level. At Awaken, we only want to preach fresh, real, powerful to help you grow stronger in your walk with God, develop your faith so you can take more territory. I'm praying that God blesses you and enriches your soul as you listen to this amazing word from God. God bless you. But hey, does anybody remember um, Atari 2600? Come on, you got to be at least 40-ish, 45, maybe. Atari 2600, God bless you. That was my first gaming system, okay? That was like OG gaming system. The graphics were terrible. Okay, I'm going to show you a picture in a minute, but the graphics were, were terrible. And one of the things I loved about the Atari 2600 was a game called Space Invaders. Space Invaders was the OG game. It came out in 1978, and uh, it was the first kind of fixed shooter game. And so uh, it set the standard. I was reading this article about it. It set the standard for these types of games. And by 1982, four years later, grossed $3.8 billion, $13 billion in today's economy. Highest grossing video game of all time at that point. It was preeminent in the gaming world, and it's still considered one of the most influential video games in history. The pixelated enemy alien has become a pop culture icon, apparently, um, often representing video games as a whole. And so this is like one of the most influential games, and I have some pictures of what it looked like. This is the alien. I mean, look at the detail. (laughs) That was the games I played, people. I'm just dating myself. And then uh, let's show the picture of the game. This is the game. So you had all of these aliens united coming against this little blob with a laser. So the, the, the idea is for that little blob, that little thing, to defeat the constantly descending waves of aliens with a horizontal moving laser. Eventually, the alien's onslaught would be too great, and the game would end with essentially the aliens taking over the world and overwhelming this little laser. The title of my message is Space Invaders. Space invaders. Come on, you and I are called to invade space. You and I are called to fill the earth. You and I are called to invade school boards, to invade government facilities, to invade education and business and media. You and I are called to fill the earth, to make disciples of nations, not to be discipled by nations, but to make disciples of nations. And in this game of life in Christianity, you're not the little laser, you're the aliens. We are the aliens strategically united with an onslaught, constantly attacking, looking to take over the systems of the world. We're not defending territory. We're taking territory. We're moving forward. We're on attack. That's who we're called to be. Did you know the Bible calls you and I an alien? 1 Peter 2.11 says, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers in this world. John 18, 36 says, my kingdom, Jesus speaking, is not of this world. You and I are not of this world. This is not our final destination, but we are here on assignment to invade space, to be space invaders, not to be space invaded, but to be space invaders. That's what we're called to do. We get in trouble when we're in the world and of the world, but we have to be in the world, not of the world, but we got to be in the world. But sometimes it takes a little bit of violence. This is like the first violent game. It's like the first shoot 'em up game, Space Invaders. And sometimes we got to get a little bit violent as Christians. Sometimes we we got to step up and do some things. We got to get uncomfortable. You know what the Bible says in Matthew 11, 12, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. If you're going to take something, you got to get up in somebody's business. If you got to take something, you got to get in somebody's space. And so we got to get violent as Christians. We got to get a little bit aggressive and on attack, not just defending land, but taking land and taking territory. 1 John 3, 8 says, he who sins is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. But for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. So anything that the devil is doing, you and I are called to destroy it. You and I are called to get a little bit violent, perhaps, to take down strongholds that the devil has set up 
against us or against our region or against our city. But I'm believing that one day soon, San Diego will again be a city for Christ, that the most preeminent voice in our city will be the voice of the kingdom of God, will be the voice of the church, will be the voice of Jesus. But we got to invade space and we got to get a little bit violent. You know what I like to do when I, or you know what I think of when I think about violence? I think of Mark 16 where it says, um, those who believe will cast out demons. To cast out a demon, you got to get in its face. you got to invade its space. You have to confront it. And the word cast means to violently throw out, to evict. And sometimes we got to get a little bit feisty as Christians and take care of some business. I love the fact that our cherished ladies went into a casino and brought the glory of God. Went into what people would say is a dark place and brought the light. They invaded some space in Funner, California, which is hilarious. Another violent activity in the spirit is praying. Did you know that? Sometimes you might not think of praying as being violent, but the Bible kind of peels back the spirit realm in Daniel 10 and shows us what happens when we pray. Daniel is praying for 21 days. He's going on a fast, and the Bible says that as he prayed, angels, plural, were released on his behalf to pick a fight in the spirit realm with the demonic strongholds that was holding things back. And so the Bible says that as he prayed and because he kept praying that after 21 days, that stronghold was broken and victory was won for Daniel. And so when you pray, you are unleashing heavenly hosts on your behalf to fight for you. You are picking a fight in the spirit realm. And you and I are called not just to invade space on earth, but to invade space in the heavens. We're meant to attack in the heavens and in the earth, both a two-pronged approach. So that's what prayer does for us. Another violent thing is getting somebody saved. That's so violent. If you want to be spiritual, introduce them to Jesus. Introduce somebody to Jesus because what you're doing is literally ripping somebody out of hell and placing them into heaven. You're breaking the grip of the enemy on their life and you're putting somebody in heaven. That is violent, people. That is crazy. That is crazy. Sometimes you got to get violent. The other thing is speaking the truth. Nowadays, that's violent. Nowadays, the truth is offensive. But the Bible says the truth will make you free. So when you speak the truth and someone receives the truth, they get broken out of jail. That's violent. That's violent. They've been in chains, but now they're free. We got to be people that are bold enough to speak the truth. And that and that that's kind of uncomfortable sometimes because it's invading somebody's mind space. It's invading the way people think. It's invading their behaviors, perhaps. Of course, in a loving way, because we're the church, but we got to do it in a loving way. But we got to be able to speak the truth in love. Some of our friends were um recently at a, an executive meeting, a very high-level executive meeting for a social media company that's very famous and that you would all know. So they're at this meeting, and they're in this meeting, and they're talking about inclusion and making sure that they're not excluding anybody from the things that they're posting or being allowed to post. So they're including people that uh, specifically they were talking about genders. And so they're including all of these different, they don't want to offend anybody, and so they want to include everybody. Have you ever noticed that the, the people that we're trying not to offend are usually the people that are the most unhealthy and dysfunctional? But we're bowing to the culture of the world and trying to appease them instead of speaking truth to them so that they can be free. That's the point. And so they were talking in this, in this environment, and I was so proud of our friend because she went up to one of the executives and she said, hey, we don't really like this. Why are you doing this? You're confusing our kids. We don't like it. And, and the, the person was like, well, wait a second. We don't want to offend people. We want to include everybody. We don't want people to be offended and not use our website or be scared or be bullied or whatever. And she said, well, well we don't like it. As parents, we don't like it. Like, why are you, why are you so, so... Um, uh, bent on, show, on showing this stuff, on including all of this stuff. She said, we don't like it. Our kids are being confused. And the girl looked at her, this executive, and said, really? Are there more people like you? <laughs> and it sounds funny, but it's true. They've been blinded because no one's telling them the truth. 
No one's telling them that that's confusing people and actually keeping people in bondage. When you don't tell the truth, you just put another chain around their jail cell and keep them where they are instead of setting them free. We need to be setting people free. Right now, we're so worried about offending people that we make these programs where they just funnel money to the poor people and allow them to set up tents in cities instead of teaching them how to make money. So we think the, the, the answer is just to give people money. But that's not the answer. Sure, it's nice to give people money that need money and poor people money. That's great. That get, maybe get them on their feet. But at some point, we got to teach them. But what happens is these people that are in high places, because they're not righteous people in authority, where people rejoice, they're wicked people, where people are groaning. So they create these programs so they don't have to get their hands dirty. So they decide to throw money at them. So it looks like we're doing stuff. Meanwhile, they're doing all this research and paying themselves at the same time. And so that's why Jesus said, I came to preach the gospel to the poor, not to give the poor money. Because just giving the poor money is sympathizing with them, which again, just wraps another chain in their jail cell. They need the truth. That's why Jesus came to preach the gospel. When we cease to tell people struggling with identity, struggling with sexuality, people that are confused about life, life in the womb, when we refuse to tell them the truth because we are scared to offend them, all we are doing is putting another chain on their prison. You know who I like? I, I like watching like clean comedy. And so I like watching these comics and Pastor Andre and I talk about this sometimes. I like the comics that don't care. <laughs> they make fun of white people, black people, Asian people, Mexican people, tall people, short people, gay people, straight people. They don't care. Because they're healthy, they don't get offended. When I hear those guys talking about white people, I don't get offended. Because I'm healthy. And I know that we can go to a place of derogatory and all of that. But what I'm saying is, we've become so, so offendable and so nervous to offend people. We're not telling people the truth and we're keeping them in bondage. Sympathy is what you give people in their situation when you have no power to change their situation. Sympathy is what thousands of people had when they walked by the, the lame guy in the gate beautiful and they gave him money and they said, my thoughts are with you, my prayers are with you, and they just sympathized with him, but he stayed there lame for 40 years. I'm grateful that Peter and John walked up and they said, I don't got no sympathy, but what I do have is power. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Get out of your dysfunction. Get out of your unhealthiness. Rise up and walk. Sympathy ends with pity and feeling bad for people. Jesus wasn't moved by sympathy. He was moved by compassion. Compassion may start with pity, but it ends with pulling people out of their dysfunction and empowering them to be what they were called to be. We can't be people moved by sympathy. We got to be people moved by compassion because you have been given power to change this world. Some other violent things in the kingdom is to love somebody sometimes loving people is violent this is what it says in the bible i mean this is kind of crazy proverbs 25 21 to 22 says if your enemy is hungry give him bread to eat if he's thirsty give him water to drink for so you will heap coals of fire on his head Ooh, that's kind of violent it's kind of mean and the lord will reward you we call it killing people with kindness when someone that you shouldn't love on the surface, you begin to love and show them that God loves them and, the, and you respond to them in a way that they're not expecting, all of a sudden, you will find favor with those people and perhaps find an opportunity in, to introduce them to the truth so that they can be free. But sometimes it's violent. It says gonna, you're going to heap coals of fire on their head just when you love people. Well, we're called to love people. We don't hate people. We hate the demonic forces and agendas driving the agendas that's tearing our country and people apart. We love the people and we hate the agenda. Did you know you don't have to, uh, uh, did you know you can hate agendas? You can hate evil. Jesus is complimenting the Ephesian church in Revelation because they hate evil. They don't hate people. They hate 
evil. So that's the kind of people that we need to be because we are space invaders and we're going to invade space in love, in power, in joy, armed with truth, in Jesus' name all over our city. Genesis 1, 27 to 28 says it. It says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, go be space invaders. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Don't fill the earth and be subservient to it. Fill the earth and subdue it. Take authority. You've been given authority, so go and take it. Dominate the earth and serve the king. Don't go to the earth and serve the earth. Don't let their culture come into our culture. When we get their culture, we lose our influence. When we lose our culture, we lose our influence. We can't dabble in the world and expect to have an impact. The bride, uh, sorry, the church has tried to appease the earth instead of subdue the earth. And so some of the most largest, most influential churches in the world have crumbled or lost their influence because they've invited in the voice of the world. And it's the saddest thing, social justice, come on in. They lost their influence. They've been, they've conformed to the world instead of allowed the word to transform the world. Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you might prove what is a good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So we have to, we have to not conform to the world, but transform our minds so that we know what the will of God is, so that we know what to carry into the world. But it's happened all throughout the Bible where the church, where the people of God have invited in the voice of the world and things begin to crumble. 1 Samuel 28, 3 to 7, Saul is the king. And Saul started out, started out pretty good, but then he stopped obeying God. And Samuel, who represented the voice of God, who represented, you know, he was the prophet in that day to Saul, he dies. And we pick up the story. It says, now Samuel had died and all of Israel had lamented for him and buried him in Ramah in his own city. And Saul had put the mediums and the spiritists out of the land. Then the Philistines gathered together and came and encamped in Shunem. So Saul gathered all of Israel together and they encamped at Gilboa. Then Saul saw the army of the Philistines, and he was afraid, and his heart trembled greatly. Because he was disobedient to God, he was separated from God, and the spirit of fear came and dominated his life. And when you have a spirit of fear, your sound mind goes away, and you begin to be confused and afraid. So his heart trembled greatly, and when, Samuel, when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him because he was being disobedient either by dreams or by Urim or by the prophets. Now, if you and I aren't hearing from God, maybe the best thing to do is to repent from being disobedient so that you can reconnect with God. Saul does not do that. It says, then Saul said to his servants, find me a woman who is a medium that I may go to her and inquire of her. So Saul is being disobedient to God, so he can't hear God's voice, doesn't know what to do with this Philistine army. So instead of repenting and going back to God, he goes to a medium in the world to ask the medium what he should do about God. He goes to the world to find out what we should be doing in the church. He goes to the world to find out what we should be doing in our business. He goes to a medium, a spiritist, to find out what God is saying. It's backwards. It's like a doctor going to a lawyer to ask him how to be a doctor. Why would you do that? <laughs> but Saul does it. We do it. Churches have done it. They bring in the voice of the world, and they crumble, and they lose their influence. Why are we doing this? Because we're scared to offend people. We're scared to speak the truth. There was a church in another state where the pastor made a mistake. It was a trivial mistake from what I understand, kind of behind the scenes. But what does the church do? They hire an outside uh, attorney's firm to judge the pastor to see if he transgressed the articles in the church. So what do the, what do the attorneys do? They condemn the pastor, tell him he has to take a leave of absence and has to confess in front of the church that he made a mistake. It wasn't a, a moral mistake. It wasn't a sexual mistake. It was a trivial mistake. They didn't say the whole thing out loud, but I've just heard rumors, and I know that it was trivial. And so now this guy's life is potentially ruined, what he's been building for 15 or whatever years, because he made a mistake. You know what that tells the church? You better not be transparent. You better not tell us your junk because you only get one chance. God didn't does give you any second chances. There's no grace in this church. You just bound your church 
to be stuck with whatever's happening in the dark places. But it's because they went to a medium to find out what God wanted. King Solomon in 1 Kings 11, 1 to 4 says this, but King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, the woman of all of the bites, ites, from the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, you shall not intermarry with them, nor, they, nor with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love, and he had 700 wives, princesses and 300 concubines basically half of cherish <laughs> exhausting yeah yeah that one guy in the pool solomon that's his new name <laughs> killing it killing it but the Bible says bad company corrupts good character. You can't have bad company in your life. You can't be of the world. Eventually, it will corrupt you. We think we can do it, but eventually, it will corrupt you. Solomon had specific guidelines from God, yet he intermarried with the world, and he lost his kingdom. He lost his kingdom. He was trying to sleep around to keep peace everywhere. He already had peace. He already had it. But because he intermarried, because he lost his culture, he lost his influence and his kingdom fail because he didn't do what God told him to do. Go down further in verse 8, it says, And he did likewise for all of his foreign wives who turned incense and sacrificed to their gods. So Solomon thought he could invite the world into his life as long as he had one hand worshiping God and one hand burning incense to their gods. We can't do it. A little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump. As soon as you let a little bit in, it can corrupt everything. We got to be people who stand for truth uncompromisingly. We can't let the world influence our church or we will lose our influence in the world. We got to kill those high places and replace it with the most high. If you look at every church that I know, every business that I know that stood up for truth, that stood up for righteousness, that, that understood that freedom comes from God, not the government, every one of those companies and churches that I know are flourishing today, and they've kept their dignity, and they've kept their integrity because they stood up. God's not going to give you assignment and then not empower you to fulfill it, not resource you to fulfill it. He's going to do that. But I get it. I get why. Sometimes we compromise. I get why, because sometimes what the devil has to offer looks pretty good. Sometimes it sounds pretty good. Sometimes women's reproductive rights doesn't sound that bad. But when you really look at what that means, it means legalizing abortion or pro-choice or whatever. When you look at some of the things that the world is saying, social justice, let's just include everybody. Let's just be woke. Let's just include everybody. There's hundreds of ways to God. There's all of these different things that we can be doing. When we compromise um, all of those different things, we're actually losing our influence. But I get it. I was sitting in Twisted the Musical a few years back right here in the front row. Twisted the Musical is our Christmas production that is unbelievable. So if you've never been, go. Go. But I'm watching the Twisted the Musical, and in the musical, we have a devil in the musical, and he's kind of coming against Scrooge and all this kind of stuff. And this particular year, we had this beautiful woman who was, has the most beautiful voice, maybe that I've ever heard, and she's singing these songs. And as she's singing these songs, I'm like, this is so incredible. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, that's how people get seduced into doing the things of this world, because it looks beautiful. It sounds amazing. And so they take a bite of the apple, but little do they know when they take a bite of the apple that looks good for food, that will able to make one wise, that will make you just like God. You take a bite and everything crumbles. We cannot, we cannot compromise, but I get why it happens. That's why we got to be truth tellers in love so we don't let people go down that same path. But if you are intermarried with the world, you may not see if you're going to mediums to ask about God, you may not see. The world will tell you that Joe Biden got more votes than any other president in history. And if you're not clued into 
the Spirit of God, if you just listen to whatever you're told, you might believe that. But if you step back and you realize, hang on a second, how come in the rallies I saw 17 socially distanced cars for this guy, but for this you know, supposedly racist, mean guy, I saw 40,000 plus filling stadiums. How did he get more votes than anybody in history and he lose? But if you're intermarried with the world, you may not see. Wow. Remember that, that executive said, are there more people like you? She had no idea. Some people are being used by the enemy and don't know it. Some people are being used by the enemy and know it. Yeah. We got to tell the truth to both people yeah. in love. Yeah. If you're going to the world to ask how we deal with things in the Bible, you may think... That the LGBTQ is the predominant group in America. That everybody's doing, that everybody's for it. And let me reiterate, we love those people, but I hate that agenda that's trying to confuse my kids. We got to tell them the truth in love just like everybody else. We care about them. We care about America. We care about our kids. But you would think that would be the predominant thing in America right now. If you just listen to the news and you're intermarried with the world. But did you know the movie Bros that just came out? Yeah. Total flop at the box office. Grossed $4.8 million, $4 million at the box office opening weekend. Did you know that the most unwoke movie of our day, Top Gun, grossed $248 million opening weekend in the box office? 4.8 to 248. Where do you think America stands on all of this stuff? And the producers of Bros are blaming us for not going like we're bigots and racist and unsupportive. It's like, what? We just don't want to go. You can go. Who cares? And so if, if we don't support them, we're racists and bigots and all this kind of stuff, but we're just trying to raise our kids, go to work, have a life, go on vacation, have fun, come to church, but we're bigots. Scientists this last week, the Surgeon General of Florida came out and said, studies have shown, studies have continually been showing, by the way, but they said studies have shown, and now we do not recommend the COVID-19 vaccine especially in men from 18 to 39, because it causes heart-related deaths. Now, we've known this for a long time, but if you're intermingled and intermarried and going to the world for your advice and for how you should treat your life and operate, then you might think that getting the vaccine was a good idea. But we know that people have been dying. We know the, the real numbers. We know that the studies have been coming out for a very long time. And already Twitter has, has, uh, has uh, banned that statement by the Surgeon General and caused it as misinformation. Already, just a couple of days after it came out, saying it's misinformation. Now, I'm not condemning you if you got the COVID-19 vaccine, but I will tell you that let us pray for you. Because the Bible says if you drink anything deadly, those who believe it shall not hurt you. So we want to pray with you and believe with you that none of that stuff's going to happen. Because the power of God can set you free from that as well. As well. But if you're intermarried in the world, it's going to be tough. John, Joshua 1.3 says this, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to, Mo to Moses. Every place your foot will tread. So it's talking about future things in the past tense. That means when you arrive on the scene, God has already given it to you. Wherever place you go, and I'm not just talking about a locality or a physical place. I'm talking about the atmosphere that surrounds that place, that region, that city, that room, that classroom, that business. When you walk in, God has already given it to you. Therefore, you are the highest spiritual authority in that place. You and the Holy Ghost are the majority wherever you go, and God has already given it to you. So every place you go, God has given it to you, but it's more than just the physical place. It's the space. If you look at that word, it's the condition of the area. It is the locality, but it's also the condition of the area. We have to take authority. When the righteous are in authority, 
not just government seats, when you're in authority wherever you go, the people will rejoice. The people will rejoice. And so we got to take authority in those places. But let me tell you this. We do believe that every physical place our foot will tread, God has given us. That's why we put in two offers this week, and we're negotiating on another property because we are expanding and taking territory in this church. Taking territory is a spiritual act. If you don't believe me, go to Israel. Go to Israel. But I love Jesus because he was the number one space invader. Matthew 4, 23 to 24. It's bigger than just locations. It's rooms. It's cities. It's regions. It's languages. It's environments. It's media. It's everything. Every place. It says this. And Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues. He was teaching in their synagogues his message. So he wasn't afraid to go into a place that wasn't his to bring the gospel that was his. He was not ashamed of the gospel because he knew it was the power of God unto salvation. That's what Paul said. So Jesus goes into their environment bringing his message. He was a space invader. Come on, we went into Harris Casino and brought his message into their casino. And their people got saved. That is so powerful. Then it goes on, it says, in healing all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of disease among the people. Now, this is revolutionary because this was, this was anti-Old Testament people of God. In the Old Testament, they would say, stay away from the diseased people. Let them have their own space. Stay away from the lepers. In fact, the lepers had to walk around and say, I'm a leper, I'm a leper, and they had to stay away. They couldn't be around people. But Jesus is flipping the script. He said, I'm a space invader. I'm a New Testament Christian. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm not going to give them their own space. I'm going to lay hands on their space. I'm going to love the people that maybe I shouldn't love in order to set them free. So he invades their space and he lays hands on them, not fearing what was on them is going to get on him, but being excited that what's in him was going to get on them. And so he lays his hands on them and heals the sick and sets people free. He invaded their space. Then it says this, then his fame went throughout all Syria and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them all. What happens when we are bold to invade space, when we are strong enough to stand for our culture, when we speak the truth, when we get violent in the spirit realm, is eventually the fame of Jesus will go out there and the people out there will bring them in here. Jesus healed the sick. He invaded their space. He loved people. He brought joy. He brought salvation. He brought the gospel so much so that they started bringing people to him. And we've seen this at Awaken Church that as we've stood up, that as we've loved people, as we haven't just sympathized with them, but we've brought the power of the Holy Spirit to them to transform their lives, we've seen people bringing other people because they know what God did for them, God can do for them. Eventually, the Bible says in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be the preeminent mountain. People will run to come in to the house of God. If there was a storm out there, it's storming, it's bucketing down rain, sideways rain, high winds. And someone's walking down the street and they see a building like this and it says church, it says shelter, it says refuge on it. And they do everything they can. They fight against the wind, they fight against the rain. And they get into this building and they look up and they see that there's no roof. So they've done everything they could to come into the house of God, but they found that the storm out there is the same storm that's in here because there's no roof, because the church got woke up, because the church invited the mediums and intermarried with the world. And so the weather out there is the same as the weather in here. What's the point? That's not awakened church. We're not here to sympathize with you. We're here to set you free. We're here to bring the gospel. We're here to invade your space. We're here to love you. We're here to bless you. 
We're here to change your life. We're here to introduce you to Jesus. Bible says when we lift up his name, he will bring all men and women to himself. That's what we're here to do. That's who we are. Let's stand to our feet. I want to pray for some people because Jesus was the first space invader. He was a local in heaven, but he came to earth as a foreigner and as an alien. He came here to invade your space. The Bible says when we accept him, he comes and lives in our heart. He invades our heart space with a violent act of love. He was crucified, and he absorbed your sin and my sin on the cross once and for all so that you could be saved, so that you could spend eternity in heaven. He's an awesome God, and I want to introduce you to him today. If you don't know him, I want you to know he loves you. He's passionate about you. He created you. He created you to fill the earth, subdue it. He's given you an assignment in this life that only you can accomplish with his power, the supreme power. So let's all close our eyes just for a few seconds. I just want to ask you this question. If you're here today and you've never invited Jesus into your life, you've never said, Jesus, invade my space, I want to follow you. Or maybe you're here and you need a second chance. Maybe you've made a mistake or maybe you feel just far from God and you're saying, God, I need a, I need a fresh start. If you're one of those two people with every eye closed, would you just lift your hand where you are? I want to pray for you today. God bless you, sir. Thank you. God bless you, sir. Thank you. God bless you, sir. Thank you. God bless you. Is there anybody else? Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you up there. I see that hand. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Thank you. I see that hand to my left. Thank you. Thank you right here. Thank you. Thank you over there. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else? I see a couple hands over there. Thank you. Right here in the middle. Amen. Amen. We have a few minutes left. You can open your eyes. There was maybe 10 of you, 12 of you that lifted your hand. I would love the opportunity to pray with you today, this afternoon. So I want to ask you to do something really powerful and really brave. You don't have to do it, but I'd love to have the honor to pray with you. I want to ask you, those of you that lifted your hands, if you would come down to the altar and give me the privilege of praying with you personally. The whole place is going to cheer. Can you come down so I can pray for you? I know there's multiple ladies over there. Guys over here. Guys over here. How cool is that? Can we thank these guys? Can we clap? This excites me because I know everything can change from this moment. And I'm sure a lot of you have felt like a maybe a void in your life or, or whatever, a lack of purpose or hope, or maybe you've continued to hit walls. You can't, haven't been able to break through. Today is a brand new day. It's a brand new start. Everything can change just, just in a moment. So we're going to pray a prayer. I'm going to lead you all in a prayer. Everybody's going to pray it. And we're going to ask Jesus to come into our lives and to invade our space. And he's going to come and live in your heart today forever and ever. So let's say these words. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending Jesus to die on a cross for my sins. Lord Jesus, today, I invite you into my life, and I ask that you would invade my space, that you would live in my heart. I acknowledge that you are the Son of God, and God raised you from the dead. 
on the third day. This afternoon, I declare that I am saved, that heaven is my home, and God is my Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Wow, what an amazing word. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Hey, listen, for more information about our church, go to www.awakenchurch.com or subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already and download our app. It is amazing. It is chock full of incredible messages, information about upcoming events, and you can even support our ministry if you feel so inclined. We loved having you with us today. We look forward to seeing you again. God bless you. Live a life that is transformative. Bye for now.